Gig Gab, episode 362 for Monday, November 7th, 2022. Greetings, folks, and welcome or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Here, just finishing rehearsal in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here on a nice, cool autumn night in Napoma, California, it's Paul Kent. <laughs> you have cool autumn nights. It's been like 70 plus degrees. It was 78 over the weekend here. So That's uh, weird, right? It's really weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I'm literally, I've been running around for the last three days in shorts and a t-shirt. It's, it's ridiculous, but it's fine. I mean, it's, you know, it's whatever it's, you know, it's how it is. And so we've been fine. I had it could to change tomorrow, right? Uh, it could, but it, it won't dramatically. It will start getting cooler. It's supposed to rain toward the end of the week, but then I think this coming weekend, it's supposed to be back in like the high sixties. So it's also weird, yeah. but well, whatever. I mean, like I don't get to control the weather. They haven't given me those, the, uh, the passwords yet. So I don't, you work on that. Yeah, we'll work on it. But I had to, uh, I had to uh, take the cover off of the air conditioner for the studio here because I had uh, here I had three rehearsals in the last three days, and uh, it was way too hot to think about not having AC here in the studio. My studio is soundproofed and and therefore somewhat airproofed, which means you know the air from the outside doesn't really get in, and so um, it, it was going to be roasty in here if I didn't have the AC on which is just, again, mm -hmm. weird in November. But yeah, I have had, what we were figuring out, in the last five days, I have rehearsed with four different bands. One of them, three of them here, and one of them not here. Uh, Uptown Celebration, the function slash wedding band that has been on hiatus since before pandemic even started. Um, we just auditioned a new keyboard player and bass players like we found a keyboard player and a bass player through an audition process on thursday night wait wait wait, wait. what what was the impetus to get it going again i mean how did that start did you just did you just assume it was dead or did the leader send out a note saying yeah we're in mothballs for now I'll, I'll i'll let you know if i want to pick it up again I mean, what is the whole that's it's fascinating to me when a when a band goes dark for a while yeah is there life there to to you know get the electrodes going again yeah let me let me think for a second uh, there's probably parts of this that are not worthy and, and nor appropriate to share here, but um, the band had gone, had sort of petered out. Gary who runs it um, had started a couple more businesses. Um, he's kind of like, like, you know, me or y you and me even like we're you know, he's just always got stuff going on and the businesses that he had going started to consume more and more of his time. And so that sort of put Uptown on the back burner, kind of. And then COVID, you know, helped sort of nail that coffin shut. And about a year ago, we had, there was a, there was activity uh, and we talked about getting the band back together, but it's, that fizzled out very, very quickly. And at that point, Gary said, okay, yeah, that it, it's not going to work. Like we're done. I was like, okay. And he even offered, like, if somebody else wants to take the band and run with it, you know, he, he didn't have to. Mm. Yeah. And he said, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give you the name of it and you can have the, the gig masters or whatever it's called now. I forget what the spot or the joint or I don't know, gig masters changed to whatever it is, but, um, yeah. it, you know, which is where we got a lot of that work from because he had really, uh, built up our profile there and our reviews and all that stuff. But, uh, no one really did anything with it because he's the one that could make it happen in that band. Uh, you know, he, he had the formula. And so and we all, you know, I went on to our other things and it was fine. And that band never played a ton. It was, you know, maybe 12 gigs a year kind of thing, a, a once a month average, but they were always, you know, high paying gigs and it was a fun way to play covers. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then, I don't know, about a month ago, Gary reappeared and he said, Hey, you know, I've sold this, part of my business and this, that and I'm ready. You know, I've, I've got the time. I want to do this. Who's in. And our keyboard player said he couldn't do it. He had, you know, committed to 
too many things or wasn't interested or whatever. And uh, our bass player had sort of already detached. And so we auditioned uh, keyboard players and bass players on Thursday night at Gary's house. And uh, we found one of each that works well for us. Actually, I, I don't know who listens to this show because I don't get to know. We don't track you people like that. Uh, every single person that we auditioned, you know, in, like as the first guy left it was like well if that's our only option we're in great shape and we had we were it was an embarrassment of riches everybody was would have been perfect for the band and so it actually made the decision both easy and hard because it wasn't obvious which was the you know the best one they were all like wow mm. yeah yeah we, we we got to be really picky and even then it was like kind of a toss-up <laughs> um but you know moving forward and so we'll see we'll see we'll see where it goes you know which is, which is fun. And then, cool. uh, yeah. And then on Saturday afternoon, I rehearsed, that was Thursday night. We did the uptown thing Saturday afternoon here. I rehearsed with my friend Stu, uh, for one of these diaspora radio performances. We are doing the album Fleetwood Max rumors, uh, in its entirety in a couple of weeks, kind of like the thing I did with the talking heads, speaking in tongues or the Marvin Gaye, what's mm -hmm. going on. It's, it's that same kind of thing. It's always different musicians, sort of. Um, and I'm trying to think this one, I think, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of musicians that I've played in that project with before. Uh, but you know, it's a different lineup every time. This is actually the first one that I'm playing drums for, but man, like we got together here on Saturday and the first thing he said was, he's like, all right, let's, let's just play dreams and actually let's not play it. Let's sing it. Let's, let's get the vocals together. Cause this album is all about vocals. So let's use this song to sort of learn how this group of what, seven people sing together and holy crap, man. I mean, every mm -hmm. single person not only can sing and sounds good when they sing, but understands like how to pick apart harmonies and just how to find the, the how to make things work. It was like mm -hmm. butter. Oh. All the way through, too. It wasn't just that song. It was like every song. It was like, what the heck, man? Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. And we had uh, a Bitter Pill rehearsal last night here, which went well. We've got a couple of uh, big gigs coming up this weekend. We're opening for Bella's Bar Talk, both in uh, New Hampshire here at the Stone Church and then over in Maine at Portland House of Music. And so we're excited about that. And and then Fling. We actually just finished an acoustic Fling rehearsal. We have a... a gig coming up that makes more sense to do a little more stripped, a little less, you know, bashy and electric. And so we just played for like two hours acoustic and, um, it went, that, that was also fantastic. Every rehearsal I've had has been great. I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a lucky, lucky guy. It, it does sound like your music lab is pretty full right now. It's super full right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a little stressful heading into the weekend. Like, all right, I got to like, make sure I carve out enough me time so that I'm reset for the week. Because, yeah. you know, work, it, like, I don't get to just chill out all week. I actually have to work. And so I was like, all right, how do I make sure I carve out enough time to, like, decompress and yet still fit in all these commitments that I have? And and it worked out. It actually worked out really well. So Very cool. Yeah. Good for you. Happy for you. I am, too. Yeah, and I'm stoked about these gigs coming up next weekend. So Ride it. Uh, yeah, I'm riding it. Might as well. As we know, <laughs> as we have learned... Uh, we can't take the opportunity to gig for granted. So this I, is uh, true. Yeah. Now we um, last two or three gigs in this. We have one more gig for the year coming up, and okay. very odd. Uh, we don't have. I didn't book us any any casual any any club dates in December, assuming that in this big resurgence of of gigs that we saw through the summer, that we would see holiday business i think we got offered one and they didn't bite on our price and we didn't get offered i don't even know anybody who's playing a new year's eve gig i haven't seen anything you know bandied about so i'm not sure if the you know if the covid stuff coming back around is a thing again i'll, I'll tell you a story one of my friends just did a gig a, a four wall to gig and she came down with the sniffles that got a little worse uh oh tested positive started calling her friends were at the show 42 people at the show out of what 170 150 that she knows of 42 people had it so i'm wondering if the big indoor winter things are are uh, a bit of a risk again now 
You hear anything? Um, Are you working New Year's Eve? Uh, no, no. We had a um, before Uptown rekindled itself. Like probably over the summer, a gig came in to Gary, like an offer for New Year's, and he said, "Hey, you know, obviously Uptown's not going to do it. Does anyone have a band? You know, they want covers. They want, you know, they kind of wanted that that specific kind of thing. Does anybody yeah. have a band that's right to take this gig?" And Rachel. Uh, one of our singers had just joined uh, an eighties band. That's actually all ladies. And uh, she was like, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Now they didn't want just eighties music. So it wound up going to somebody else, but that's the only gig that I've really seen. Bitter pill is we, uh, these next two gigs that we play this coming weekend are our final gigs of the year. Uh, we're kind of taking some time off to, to rehearse some things and, uh, and, and that, and then Fling's got, it's got a couple of gigs kind of peppered in. We've got, I think one at the end of this month and one sort of in early December that we, that was the, that's the acoustic one. But yeah, gigs throughout the holiday season are not, I hadn't thought about it because my schedule is full enough for me. You know, like I wasn't seeking out gigs, but as you mentioned it, it was like, oh yeah, I don't like, I haven't been turning gigs down. To, to keep my schedule the way I want to keep it. You know what I mean? Like right. it's, it's just happened sort of naturally and it's fine. De December is always kind of busy for me with work. And then I have to go to CES probably in January, unless of course COVID changes that again, but I don't think it will. I think, I think that'll happen. But, um, but yeah, yeah. My guess is, you know, a lot of those corporate parties are probably being, it seems that they are, being in general, a little more risk averse this year, just mm -hmm. letting, you know, finding out what's it going to be like, I, you know, I mean, it's, I, we're getting to a point where most of the people, at least that I know that get COVID and I don't mean to be dismissive about this, but I'm just sort of acknowledging that most people that I know who get COVID only know that they have it when they've been asked to test because they're, you know, somebody that was near them, like got the sniffles, but for the most part, yeah. people are either, asymptomatic or or mild enough symptoms that it's kind of like a cold um and so and but i but i also acknowledge and realize that there's people still dying from this thing so i don't know at what point you know the the most risk averse like the comp the corporate parties and those sorts of things just say okay well we're gonna host our party and if you don't want to come because you're you're not comfortable in that kind of setting then that's okay don't don't feel obligated it, you know we're gonna yeah. do this evidently this isn't the year. So or at least this isn't the holiday season that they're doing that. Um, but maybe next year, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know anything. I just Dave bang drum. Oh, so the end of my story is we just have, uh, so we have two guys who haven't been in the band that long, one for one year and one for well, one for a year and a half, one for one year. And um, not a lot of rehearsal time over the, t over that course because I moved away and yeah, so we had pretty much the same set list, you know, maybe rotated in on a, on a two hour show, maybe five songs, but you know, we had a set list that works and this goes, this goes back to that conversation about, you know, how important is it that you refresh your set list? I, and I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to be out to, out to lunch on that. Yep. Um, however, I do get bored. And so for my own amusement, you know, seeing if we can find songs that are as good as the ones that we know are working. So sure. the last couple of gigs, you know, like we had a Halloween gig. And so I said, all right, everybody prepare Werewolves of London and uh, Monster Mash. And then we wanted to bring back My Girl. We have a nice arrangement for that. And it was a really nice sound check. You know, guys came prepared and, you know, the songs were very good. I mean, I mean, for them to be much better than they were would probably mean, you know, many rehearsals to smooth sure. over a few edges, but sure. but not nothing that most of the audience would, would hear. And uh, we're going to try a harder one this week. So, you know, um, new sensation by uh, in excess. In excess. You know sure. Yeah. That's a, yeah. that's a, that is a deceptively difficult tune. It's a, it's a weird form. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but we're going to try to bring that one back and, um, we have a cool arrangement to the clashes train in vain that we're going to do. Oh. So we're going to, yeah. I mean, and that one I think should be pretty straightforward to do. It's not, it's not terribly hard. So we'll see. I mean, if we can keep on doing this, I wonder out there in listener land, 
how much do you guys rehearse, especially since COVID? How much are you guys back in the shed, you know, smoothing out the edges versus how much do you just go to work? And then, you know, how do you, will you do something on stage without even trying it? You know, will you bring something back that you did pre COVID, you know, just assuming everybody still knows it. Do you just ask everybody good on this or do you want to hear it and hear everybody together before you put it on stage? Feedback at giggabpodcast.com folks. Yeah. Yeah. Let us know. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious to hear that too. Uh, So just to be clear, uh, just so everybody knows what you're talking about, the songs that you've brought back in, sound check is your one full band like run through of this. I don't even want to call it a rehearsal, but it's the, it's the, it's the run through where you decide, yeah, it's good enough for the show or whoa, nope, not good enough. And then that's that. Yeah. yeah. And you can tell. Oh, right you away. Can tell, yeah. Yeah. Right away. Yeah. Yeah. And the funny thing is I think new sensation will be one of those ones where many of the guys in the band know it. The guys who haven't been in the band who never played it before will probably be, Maybe. I mean, they're good players. I mean, they may be a little tentative about it, but we'll see. And uh, Or it could think- be that the guys that don't know it are the ones that shed it the most and, and commit that to that form yep. where the guys that say, yep. oh, yeah, I got this tune. I, I've, I've, heard, I've heard this song all my life. I know it. Yep. And then you go to play it and you're like, uh, maybe not. <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. I've, I've certainly done. I've been guilty of that. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I got this tune. Then you start playing. It's like, oh. <gasps> Oh no, no, I don't. I actually don't know this song. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I don't know this song. The radio in my head is not as accurate as I thought. Yeah, ah, fun. Well, I hope. Uh, I'm curious to hear how that NXS tune works out. I'm glad the I am, other. I'm curious as well. Yeah, I'm glad the other two worked out for you. That's good. Well, they we'll see if they work out. The other the other two shows have had songs that we've brought back that have been pretty good. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know I've been pretty diligent getting our calendar done for next year, right? So again, my deal with the guys, if you don't remember, was we're going to do one weekend a month, January, February, March, and April, two weekends a month, May through August, maybe September. It was busy September this year. And then, you know, we'll see what happens, you know, in October. And then I tend to roll it back in November and December. Yep. So we'll see. I mean, I'm I'm on I'm pretty well on my way to having certainly the two weekends a month in the summer. Actually, I shouldn't say that. I have one I have one private gig in January, February, March, and April. So we're we're good, we're covered oh. there. Yeah. So I know we know our destiny there. Uh, you know, the nice thing about being together as long as we have is we've got a lot of clients, and if one falls off, I tell you, every year I assume they're all gonna fall off sure. in the same year, but that hasn't happened yet. And so you know, one came back that's been gone four or five years, you know, was, was kind of nice. There's one gig where we've had a long relationship with them. And the guy who booked us for years, very good guy, has retired and handed the reins over to someone else who, by all appearances, is fumbling away a lot of musician goodwill in this place, like not getting back to people. Because he didn't get back to me. And I was like, really? And then... I asked some other musicians to play there and they're like, nope, I haven't heard from them. So it's one of those things where this one guy built this place up into a really, you know, popular gig and, and it seems to be withering away. I know I'm not holding that date anymore. It's been three months. And, wow. uh, and if I don't get it booked, you know, if someone else wants it, it's, it's an open date. As far it's, as oh, yeah, it's open at this point. Huh? That's interesting, man. That's that's. I, I mean, we've seen that happen. We've like, I think we've all seen that happen where, you know, somebody takes over and they think, Oh, I'm going to do it my way. And, and there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Except if you should know the game though, you should know what asset you're taking over. I mean, if you want to yeah. like anything, if a guy walks into a business and says, well, no, you haven't seen my fastball yet. It's, you know, <laughs> risk, risk is inherent in that approach. Oh yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, whatever, uh, We'll see. Yeah, you'll see. Yeah, yeah. But thankfully, you've got enough of a, you know, a Rolodex that it's, you're able to fill most of those dates. It's pretty good. Yeah, I think we're feeling pretty good. I got a good question for you. Hi, man. Pick three of, of, in your whole gear arsenal, what are the three non-replaceable gigs? What are the, th- the three non-replaceable tools? What are, like a pair of sticks, a, 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 a kick drum, you know, a, your stool. What are your three things that you've gone through many iterations, many vendors, and what are your three things that you're absolute can't live without? 
Oh man. Um, I don't, that's a really good question. I, I mean, I, I don't know that there's anything where I would say I must always have that. Um, I, I, I have things that I'm very, very happy with right now. Like that new ride symbol that I got the, the, yeah. um, you know, the, the pasty, the, uh, I can't remember what the model is, but, um, that, the the dark ride that, that is the ride symbol I've been looking for for a very long time. So I, mm-hmm. I, that I don't, I like currently that I wouldn't want to replace that. Um, my, in my snare drum arsenal, I have two that are my go-tos right now. And it really depends on the room and the situation. You bring them both to every gig? Every gig. Yep. I, yeah. It's the, the black beauty is one and it's a, a five and a half inch deep black beauty. And actually, no, that, that one's a six. And then the other one is uh, my Eames birch snare drum that I've had since 93, maybe even 92. That's a custom built drum, right? It was a custom built drum. It's, it's uh, two inches thick of birch with a really tight cut bearing edge. So it's got super sensitivity and it's a five and a half inch drum. Uh, it's a w- much warmer sound than you'd normally get out of wood uh, or than I would normally get out of wood. And, uh, so I, I like those, you know, those things are certainly there. I'm trying to think if there's anything else, I, you know, my, my vocal mic, I can't imagine not using a Heil from the PR 30 series. Uh, those I have found to be perfect for me vocally. They fit my voice. They fit the way that I like to sing and the way that I like to uh, affect mic technique. I, I don't have to think about how I'm doing things. I can blend harmonies perfectly with them. Uh, so, you know, those would be the things, the, the snare, the ride and the, um, the, the vocal mic. That makes sense. I think so. How about you? Um, my first thing would be my Bose tower, my Bose sound oh. system. That just, it sounds good everywhere. I can play at any volume. It's just, always works exactly how I would want it. So I love that thing so much for acoustic gigs on my electric rig. I, I bought a pedal that's out of production. So I spent a little bit more than I would usually spend for a pedal. What kind of pedal? It's, called a, it's an overdrive pedal to dual overdrive. It's, 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 uh, it's called a way huge. No, no, I'm sorry. This one's called the camel toe. No jokes there. It's called the camel toe and it's, and it's two famous overdrive pedals in one. I use one side for just the, it just gets the perfect crunch tone for me yep. for rhythm and then one side for, for solos. And it's just having used many, many, like most guitar players have many, 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 many overdrive pedals. This one just had as the perfect tone for me and it, it has changed my rig for the better so much. And then the third one, I really, really, really like that G seventh capo that I have for acoustic gigs. I mean, it just never changes the tonality, you know, never, never pulls on strings and makes one string a little bit sharper flat. I mean, it it just works exactly as I need it to have. It's expensive for capo, but it's, it's, it's a perfect capo. It's a perfect tool. I would say those three things are, are my gotta, the three blessings in my three gear blessings in my life. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I like, yeah, man. Like it's the things that you know you can rely on at at a gig, and that's uh, like you have to have things that you can be comfortable using. Yeah, and yeah, um, uh, makes sense to are me. Are you man. are you a, a gearaholic? Like, do you have way more gear than you need, or do you only have what you need? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't think I have an overabundance of gear. However, I'm not sure that other people would say the same (laughs) thing. I mean, like I don't have, you know, I've got like four or five snare drums that that I would use, but really only three that I would like rely on. And that's, that's pretty light for most drummers, especially, you know, my age would probably have, you know, 15 different snare drums that they would use. But you know, I, the, the drums that I have work for me, I can make them do what I need to do. And so it's good. Um, I, I have, I'd probably have an extra drum set and a half. I have a, the, you know, the, the Mapex kit that I have here in the studio. I have the Eames kit that I generally gig with. Um, 
given that we're going to be re- re- rehearsing at Gary's house for some of these uptown things, he asked if I had, you know, a set that I could put over there. So I put like my, my Ludwig, I have this old white Ludwig rocker two kit. So I put a four piece kit over at his house. And that, that that's like the drum set that I've had since I was a kid, you know, since I was a yeah. teenager. Do you have a, a kit? Like remember uh, for acoustic gigs, if you want to strip down, like I know you play your cajon mostly, but yeah. do you have a really, like a really small snare drum when you know it's going to be low volume type stuff, but you want to play full kit? Um, Yeah, I, I, I can, I do like the, the third snare drum that would be in my arsenal is a quieter snare drum. It's a, a wooden Ludwig drum. It's, it's from that rocker two era. It's nothing special from, you know, that would be special on anyone's list, but it's a drum that I know really well. And it, it doesn't have quite the projection of most snare drums, but the other thing I can do. And like what I did at Gary's house is I have this thing called the BFSD, the big fat snare drum. And it's, it's actually two things that, sit on top of the drum there. It's like film. That's it's almost like another drum head that you put on there. And, uh, and it's, it's like a, a tone ring. If you've seen people put those on drums, but this one's like a really thick tone ring. It only leaves like maybe a four inch hole in the center. And that really deadens a snare drum. Um, so like, that's what I used at, at Gary's house for rehearsal. And I always have that with me at gigs, in case, you know, the room is just too ringy or bouncy or just too loud yeah. in general, I can just throw that on the, the snare and then it's fine. And, um, cool. and it, it dials it in. Yeah. So no, I don't have a specific snare that's like super quiet, but I can, I can make a snare quiet. And I also don't have to like lay into it and, you know, beat the crap out of it either. Uh, you know, right, right, right. but, but well, I know what I was going to ask you. Yeah. I have another question. Sure. So a friend of mine called about, he wanted to get into doing this solo acoustic thing. Yeah. And he, we have, we have a mutual friend who's doing this acoustic thing largely to tracks, full band arrangements of MIDI tracks. Right? Sure. Yeah. Are you finding that where you are that, that like solo guys play to tracks as opposed to just playing your instrument? You're finding that like smaller places want full band sound without full band hassle. Do you see that very much there? Um, no, no. I mean, I, I know a few acoustic guitar players who play solo gigs using loopers, but that's that. I mean, I, I realize that's not what you're asking, but that, that's about that's as far, that's about as close as I've seen it get here. Yeah. 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 So, so there's a lot of solo work or duo work. There are some guys doing looping with a great variance in, in, chops um the thing about looping is it really exposes someone's time you know like like if you if you lay down a loop that has bad time you're listening to bad time yes. looping over and over again it's very hard to listen to yeah and you know it's like can someone play to a crick a click right i mean you're locked into what's you know coming out so so there's there is some looping but there are more people doing full MIDI arrangements. Sometimes they're just buying them off the shelf, but sometimes they're doing their own MIDI arrangements for songs. Sure. And everything from like a solo singer who is basically doing karaoke to, um, you know, like Mary Ellen and Tom, she sings, he plays guitar, but they have a full band oh. of of tracks that they pay to. And they, they work a ton and people seem to like it. That's I mean, good. people get up and dance. It, it's, a, it's almost a surreal thing that people want the feeling of a band, but they don't miss that it's not a band in, in smaller environments. Sure. Like, I don't think if you put them in front of 5,000 people, I don't know if it would translate as well. Yeah. But, yeah. No, but, I get um, it. Like coffee shop kind of vibe. Restaurant. Yeah. 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 Hi, I, I, it makes You're not sense. finding that that thing is the thing there. No, no. I, I mean, I don't want to say that. I think the, 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 scene for cover music is different here than it is where you are. Um, You've said that a few times. Yeah. I I mean, it certainly works. Like I went and and saw my friend John who plays guitar in, uh, in better pill, John McCormick. He's got a band called uh, the wheel of awesome, which I think I've mentioned on the show before. It's a great vibe. Uh, It's a great shtick. They have this wheel that they, they have built 
and they spin it and there's, I don't know, 20 or 25 different slots on the wheel. And it's like, you know, one of them is 80s song. One of them is Beatles. One of them is punk. And they just spin the wheel after every song. They have no idea what the set list is going to be. Neither do you. And it, ma- yeah, it keeps it interactive. It, it forces you to kind of, you, you understand what's happening on stage and why it's happening. And it, the, any dead air is sort of part of the show while they try to decide, Oh, we got to play an 80 song. Well, we just played an 80 song. What do we play? You know that, and those conversations sort of happen in quote unquote in public. Right. And, and so it's fun. Um, that works. And there, there certainly are, you know, cover bands that play bars and, and all of that, but it's not, it's not quite the same. The tribute bands get a lot of work. Um, obviously function bands, wedding bands, corporate parties, whatever that is, you know, they get work, but you don't, you don't really see that happening. That's that those are private events, uh, you know? So, um, so it's different here, but, but the acoustic, like, I would say there's more interest in cover music for that sort of acoustic, you know, coffee house restaurant, you know, that kind of vibe going on. So it, it surprises me that I haven't run into that, but I also wouldn't get called for those gigs, Paul. So maybe it's happening and I'm completely and blissfully unaware Uh, of it. (laughs) Funny. Well, I could be, I mean, you know, it's like, if you don't, if you don't need a drummer, well, then Dave's phone doesn't ring, you know, Dave sits on the couch. So, yeah. Um, we got a question from listener Russ and I, I will read it and then we will dissect it. He says, uh, I love the show. Lots of great information. I've been playing music for around 30 years now. And for the past few years, I've been exclusively in cover bands. I'm looking to get back into playing originals. I miss having an artistic and creative outlet and you just don't get that playing covers. This renewed interest is in part a result of listening to you guys talk about your bands and realizing that something has been missing, missing in my life. All that being said, here's my question. How does someone go about getting into a professional original band? I've done the garage band thing where you rehearse in someone's basement once a week and play a few gigs a year just for the fun of it. But I need slash want more than that. I want to be with musicians who take this as seriously as I do and have the goal of making some money at this like me. I live in, he's in central New Jersey. He says, so I have close proximity to New York city. So I suppose options are there as well, but where do I start? So I I think I I can certainly answer this as someone who plays in a couple of original bands and has on and off throughout my life. But I think there's a lot of this. That's just, how do I find the right band for me? uh, Type of advice that we can give here, Um, you know, for original bands, but really for any band, I've found them one of two ways, friends slash musicians that I know inviting me to play with them and yeah. Craigslist style ads for which I audition. And, and it's a mutual audition. I mean, it's, it, you know, you, you make sure it's a good fit. Um, and I've only found one original band, the Craigslist way. It wasn't Craigslist because it was 1995, um, but it was through the Austin Chronicle uh, which was, you know, effectively Craigslist before that existed. And, uh, and, and that was hypnotic clam bake. Um, and I went on the road with them. They had put ads, mm. they had put ads in the sort of local rags in the cities that they were touring through knowing that they needed a drummer six months later or something. But, um, but that's, so that's how I found that. But I do see a lot of people out there, you know, on Craigslist and and other various places, even on Facebook, that's how we found Jamie Bradley for Fling. Was we I, we put a note out on Facebook and Jamie reached yeah. out. Uh, but I see I see ads out there where people say, "Hey, I'm a you know singer songwriter. I've got some tunes, and I want to. I'm putting together a band, and I want to move forward. And I've even seen posts where it's like, you know, I have a working original band and our bass player left and we need a new bass player. And so, you know, reach out just like you would with a cover band. My advice would be find out what songs they're playing. And with an original band, you probably don't know them if they just tell you the name. So ask for demos. And even if it's just a, you know, somebody recorded it on their phone, you get a feel for whether this is something that would be of interest to you to put your time into. And then, and then use that as the litmus test and, and then go play with them and see how it works and, you know, all that. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I mean, you know, with Craigslist or Facebook, 
you're going to go through some muck to find some yes. diamonds, right? Yes, of course. And that's just part of the deal. Yep. If you are a networker and you go to places where there's original bands and you you know meet many people and let them know you're looking and, and increase your circle, that's probably going to get you closer sooner or or you know without as much muck. Yeah. Um, but you know that's a that's a social exercise that not everybody's comfortable with. But that that is, I found better people in general from the community of musicians that I know. I remember early in my band, we, we, we were trying to find a drummer. Man, I had, people came in to play, one of our audition songs was Soul Man. You have never heard John Bonham play Soul Man so many times. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they just were such heavy hitters and no no real sense of the music that we had. And that's what you get when you're on Facebook or, or on Craigslist or both of them. Yeah. So, and the other thing I would say is, um, like many things in life, if you narrow your you're focused to really what you want to accomplish. You're probably going to get closer to it than like if you constrain yourself to doing activities where there is original music happening or original musicians happening, that is probably going to start narrowing your universe into the place you want it to be. Yeah. Uh, and so it probably makes sense, but it's a, it's a human, human engineering problem, right? You know, you gotta, you gotta find the right pools to swim in if you want to have some success. And so, I, I, that would be my guess. Again, not 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 an original music musician. However, um, Nick is in my band, and yep. um, you know he he kind of handpicks people from the communities he have who would fit the type of music that he would want to play. But you know, knowing those people, and it does actually seem like there there are many musicians who like covers is a really foreign concept to them. I mean, it, it's, it, it's that's always interesting to me because that's like ninety percent of my headspace, right? Sure, yeah, but. but but there are a lot of people who just literally approach playing music as an as an original art exercise. Find those people, you know, hang out with those people, introduce yourself to those people, check those people out, it, it, cover or original. When we were needing someone, and I made an announcement that that uh, one of our guys was leaving the band, I had twenty local musicians call and say, "Could they get an audition?" So, sure. so keep your eyes open. You know, know the bands in the area that you want to play that play the style of music that you like to play. Network, 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 you know, don't be afraid if you find some people who are kind of wandering out there to see if there's something you guys can put together yourself. You don't necessarily have to join. I mean, that might be one of the, one of the, one of the hurdles that he wants to get over is to find something existing, but um, you got to be creative and you got to get out there and meet people in the, in the pond you want to swim in. Yeah, that's a great idea. And, and one way would be go to show, go to original shows and talk to the a talk to the musicians in the band, but B take a look around the room because the people that are into that music, there might be some musicians in the room and get to know them. And you know, now that network is kind of working in two directions for you. You might run into somebody in the room who's into it, or you might, you know, that person might be able to introduce you to the next person, but yeah, no, you're right. The networking thing, if you can get the gig that way, that's a much, I was going to say it's a much easier way. It's easier once you've got the network in place, uh, you know, getting the network in place. I mean, how do you do that? Well, then this, this is how you do that. So yeah. Yeah. Good luck, Russ. Yeah, man. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. That's, uh, that's where we're at. How, what else do we have today? Are we, are we actually finished at the 40 minute mark or, or do we have yeah, more? We haven't done a 40 minute one in, a, in quite a long time. We might be, okay. I mean, it is getting to that point in time. You've got four bands, so you're going to have a lot of stories that you're going to have to tell. I'm slowing what, down. One of them is short lived. Like one of them ends on November 18th or something when the gig's over, but you know, that's, it's just how you've it got works. three bands. There you go. <laughs> it's there you still go. three bands. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my music life is, sorting itself out in a different direction, which actually I think is part of the story of the show, right? I mean, yeah. we, I, you know, I, I'm a weekend warrior and, and I rode a very busy schedule for a long time, tried to do it full time for a while. Um, now want to try and find another balance in, in my work life and music life. I gigs all of a sudden are, are feeling, I have a different pickiness about gigs, you know, distance and pay and happiness 
uh, are really under a much tighter microscope than just filling the calendar. Yep. And uh, but I want to I want to play every spare second I have. I just don't know if I want to play out as much as it was absolutely imperative for me to do. Mm. I mean, the joy I get, the joy I get from finding music. And again, I've I've said this so many times on the show. I would love to write original music. I'm I'm so freaking critical of myself. And you've given me advice, and we've got had listeners, you know, send really nice notes. I don't know. Maybe maybe the stars will line up at, at this point in my life, or I'll be able to get something out of me. But um, music is changing for me, and that's I think part of the story of Gig Gap Podcast, right? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, like that. If we look back to where we were, each of us individually, with our musical lives you know, seven and a half years ago, almost eight years ago when we started this, it's radically different, uh, you know? Yeah. 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 Fling was basically a, a cover band playing in bars. Bitter pill didn't exist. Like not in any of the incarnations that it, that it had, uh, uh, you know, uptown was, I don't even know if that was a going concern, but if it was, I certainly wasn't aware of or involved in it. I hadn't met Stu, uh, yet. And so, and now, you know, stories evolve. The things stories, evolve? you know, yeah. that, that's, that's actually one of the beautiful things. The music is a constant. Correct. The outlet for it, the outlets for it may change over time, but that's each of our stories that we're writing as we pursue our love of music. I mean, again, there's, there's some people who do it because they they literally could not, I, I've told you this before. There are some guys in my band who are professional musicians, meaning they, they derive a hundred percent of their, income from playing music yep they have said they knew very early on they weren't going to make a tech dude salary but it was there was no choice to them what they were going to do in life have so much you know respect and admiration for sticking to their muse that way yeah um you know and that you know music. that that's an important thing because i was having a conversation with uh this woman the other day who's actually a friend of my daughter's and she's starting her own business and and my daughter put us together. She said, Oh, my dad would be happy to speak with you. And you know, if you have any questions or whatever. And she said something, she's like, yeah, as soon as I had the idea to do this thing that she's doing, she's like, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. And I was like, okay, that you are ready to do this because if you can imagine doing something else, then you should do that. And, and it's the same thing with being a full-time musician. You know, if you, because starting your own business, whether it's as a musician or anything else, is a disastrously difficult thing to get through. You are, you know, it's not going to be easy, and you have to have some drive that is going to push you to get through to the other side. And you may still fail, even with all yeah. of that, right? But you just know that you have to do it. And and that, you know, it's not just for musicians that that applies to. It's pretty much anything. If you can imagine not starting whatever the business is that you're you're about to do or, you know, whatever musical project, if you can imagine not doing it, then don't do it because it's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> but it's yeah, yeah. it's good. At, it's you know, it's it's the it's a good way to look at these things. So, yeah. Yeah. Craziness. Our, our independent lifestyles is what it really comes down to. So For sure. Yeah. Crazy people, but you know, but there are more people. to the story to write more to the story to write. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, is that it? Are we really done? I think we're done. We're done. Man. All right, we're man. Done. We're Stick done. A fork in it. Sticking a fork in it. We're playing the music. We're saying thanks because thank you. We really appreciate it. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Paul. We can't end it without you telling me something very important. Good advice. Dave, yeah. From my heart, I say, always be performing. <laughs>